it was unlike any coronation of any king in history. There was no pomp and circumstance, no billboards and advertisements announcing the ceremony, no orchestra, no extravagant decorations. In spite of this lowly coronation, he was, and is, and always will be, the greatest king. In fact, the only true king, the king of kings, and the lord of lords. No one will ever match his majesty and his regal rule, his glory, and his splendor. Hello everybody, happy Palm Sunday, I should say, I don't know if it's happy, because this marks the beginning of the end of Jesus' life and ministry, as we read about in the four Gospels found in the Bible. And uh, I thought it'd be cool to make a video today to stop and talk about, you know, the deeper meaning behind Palm Sunday, things that you may not have noticed, uh, things you maybe didn't know before. And since that we're in the middle of The Chosen, Season 4 just ended with leading right into the Passover week, and Season 5 is going to deal with the Passover week, and the season finale just ended with alluding to the triumphal entry. And if you haven't seen The Chosen Season 4 finale yet, uh, I, there won't be many spoilers in this video, but I, I would recommend proceeding with caution because we will talk about some things that we see in the Season 4 finale that do relate to the triumphal entry. But uh, this is a big event. This is one of the biggest events in history, and it's a pretty interesting uh, ordeal. So, uh, hello, my name is Eli Hollingsworth, and welcome back to Against the Current and the Chosen podcast. Let's go ahead and roll that intro. <laughs> Passover. At this time in history, anybody who was anybody in the Jewish culture was going to Jerusalem for Passover, to celebrate the Passover holiday. Now, at this point in time, Jesus had just come to the end of three years of controversy, miracles, and he had just passed through Jericho, as we learned in the book of Luke, and encountered Zacchaeus, a tax collector. So big crowds were coming to one place, all knowing about Jesus, this miracle worker guy. And he had had a lot of controversy attached to his name. And a few weeks before this, he had brought a dead man back to life named Lazarus, as we see in The Chosen Season 4. Now, Jesus is marching to Jerusalem with one thing on his mind, and that is he's to give up his life for everyone, for the salvation of the world. That's the only thing he's got on his mind, but the crowd expects more miracles. The disciples don't really know what to expect, even though he's told them multiple times that he's going to die and be resurrected. It still hasn't really sunk in for them. Up until now, he's kept a pretty low profile, telling many people when he healed them to not tell anyone about it. Now, as he approaches Jerusalem, he doesn't need to keep a low profile, nor would he want to, because it is his time. As he told his mother in John 2 at the wedding at Cana, it wasn't his time yet, but now it is. It's Sunday of Passover week, and he knows that on Friday, all of the lambs will be slain, as will he be. So as we find in Luke 19, verse 28, Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. And what this means is that he was going to climb the Mount of Olives, which was, you know, in his way from getting from Jericho through Bethpage to Jerusalem. He had to go up the Mount of Olives and he couldn't see it till he got to the peak. And when he drew near Bethpage in Bethany, he sent two disciples ahead of him to get a donkey. In Luke 19, verse 30, he says, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, you shall say this, the Lord has need of it. Now in the book of Luke, we are never told, nor in any other gospels, I believe, which two disciples were sent to bring this cult and bring it back to Jesus. But in the book of Matthew, it's noted that it's actually a donkey and her cult. So how would Matthew know that it's a donkey and a cult when this is a detail that we don't get in the other gospels? And the chosen, they portray it as Matthew was one of the two disciples that was sent to get the cult. Now Jesus tells these two disciples to say to anyone who asks that the Lord has need of it. Now it's the Passover and much like we see portrayed in the chosen finale, Everybody in the Jerusalem was worked up into a frenzy about this miracle worker. So this simple phrase, the Lord has need of it, would be enough for this person to let them take this cult. And that's what Matthew and Simon said in The Chosen, and they plays out much like it probably would have in the first century at the time. Now, as Zechariah wrote in Zechariah 9, 9, 500 years before these events, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on the colt, the foal of a donkey. Matthew and John both quote this Zechariah passage. Now this isn't much of a triumphal entry, is it? That's not till his second coming, which we learn about in Revelation. Here, he comes humbly and lowly, riding on a donkey that has never been ridden to die for our sins. 
Now here comes the reaction to Jesus' triumphal entry. After in verse 35 of Luke 19, preparing an impromptu saddle, the disciples putting their cloaks on the donkey, Jesus rode along and they spread their cloaks along the road. This is as it says in 2 Kings 9 verse 13, And they hurried and each man took his garment and placed it under him on the bare steps and blew a trumpet saying, Jehu is king. Now he hadn't gotten to Jerusalem yet and now the common people are spreading their cloaks along the road. These would not be the disciples, these would be the people of Bethpage, which as it says in verse 37, he was drawing near already on the way down the Mount of Olives. The whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice. Now it says they were shouting for all the mighty works they had seen. They had seen Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. These people in the context of the Bible had seen him give two blind beggars sight. They were crying out for all of these things that they had seen. In Matthew 21 verse 8, it says, Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. There was no holding back. This is what they've been waiting for for thousands of years. Now in Matthew 21, it says, The crowds followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Which Hosanna, save now. That's what he came to do, save now. But they had the wrong kind of saving in mind. They had in mind, save us from the Romans. But Jesus came to save from sin. And the Pharisees didn't like it. Not one bit. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. They thought it was blasphemy, and the crowd was out of control. So their only hope was to tell Jesus to tell everybody to stop. Jesus then responded, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. This word cry out also means to scream. Now this is a reference to Habakkuk 2, verses 9 through 12, which reads, Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have forfeited your life. For the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the woodwork respond. Now at the time of Habakkuk, the Israelites were very far separated from God. And they built their houses out of stone in a way that was very against God. And Habakkuk was saying in this passage that the stones made from their houses would cry out against them. This is symbolic, the way that Jesus responds to these Pharisees, and actually very witty of him, in a way that reflects how the Pharisees of Jesus' day were so far separated from the common people and were an elite country club that wanted nothing to do with the common people, in a way that they were also not living in a way that honored God. And they had separated themselves so much from God's will and the way that God intended the Israelites to live. Jesus went on in the verses 41 through 44 to prophesy their fate. Now in verse 41 it says, Jesus was sobbing over Jerusalem, and this is heavy sobbing, because he was pronouncing their judgment. Now this event, at the time, which seemed like a triumphal entry, was actually quite tragic. This is possibly the most important week in the history of the world at this time. And so to remember it today, look at the deeper meaning. The people of Israel, they didn't get it. The disciples didn't quite get it at this time either. But me and you have the chance to get it. Make sure you don't miss what Jesus was saying. Make sure you don't miss why Jesus came. I know some churches in the modern day wave palm branches on Palm Sunday, but uh, this doesn't seem appropriate or right to me because the people didn't understand why Jesus was really here. They weren't celebrating the right king. They were celebrating an earthly king there to save them from the Roman oppression when he was really there to save them from sin. So this is a very interesting passage. I can't wait to see the rest of these events transpire in the chosen season five when it comes next year. They're about to start shooting very soon. So I'm very, very excited for that. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit uh, about the triumphal entry as we went through some of the passages and things that relate to it. Make sure to let me know what you thought down below in the comments. And uh, I hope to see you guys in my next video. Binge Jesus. Mm -hmm.